Um, so even if we uh, cross-link these patients, we still need to manage their vision. So who better than Debbie Jacobs to tell us about the expanding options for rigid lenses. Thank you very much for including me and Contact Lens on the program. Um, I'll be speaking about expanding options in rigid lenses. Here are my disclosures. Um, none of them uh, bear any uh, relation to the contents of my presentation. So, specialty contact lens is a new field within United States eye care. Those, many of you may not realize that optometry graduates can do a residency, which is an additional clinical year after the optometry degree, and currently there are about 24 spots in the U.S. for those uh, residents to do work in the field of cornea and contact lens. Afterwards, they may train and work collaboratively with ophthalmologists in an integrated model of eye care. This is also a new field globally, but delivery of specialty lens care depends on the scope of practice within each country among the various eye care providers. Cornea docs must be aware of the specialty lens innovation so they can provide all options for their patients. Finally, from an industry perspective, this is the one part of the contact lens pie uh, that is growing an actual dollar, so there is industry interest in, con in specialty lenses. Now, as far as uh, RGP lenses for keratoconus, it used to just be there were gas permeable corneal lenses, but what's happened is an expansion of the types of categories, and now there are specifically keratoconus designs. There is a big group of lenses called sclerals, and I will go through the various definitions of scleral lenses, and then I'll also speak of innovations in design and manufacture. I'll address outcomes, and finally, a new paradigm as far as approaching patients with keratoconus. Let's talk a bit about keratoconus designs. This is for gas permeable corneal lenses. There are many brands, and this um, list is by no means complete. They are aspheric, and um, because of growing options for our patients in IOLs, uh, cornea surgeons and general ophthalmologists in particular are more fluent on the optics of these contact lenses as well. These newer keratoconus designs have innovative base curves. That's the back surface that can accommodate the cone. And I show you a picture of the rose K where you can see it can accommodate a nipple cone. They also have innovative optics. That's on the front surface to characterize, uh, to neutralize characteristic decentration and coma, which are both characteristic of the optics of keratoconus patients. There are also now what are called bitoric or dual aspheric designs that do both. They have modifications on both the front and the back. Now, what about scleral lenses? The definitions and distinctions are evolving. Historically, they were larger. They were molded of PMMA and often fenestrated. That arrow on the left points to the fenestration hole and the air bubble under it that allowed for oxygen supply to the cornea. On the right, you see what is more typical, a 17.5 to 19.5 lens. They're now cut on lathes or molded with digital design, and they're, used, and they're made using high decay materials. By definition, the minimal diameter is either 17.5 millimeters or, more appropriately, two millimeters past the limbus for 360 degrees. There should be no cornea touch, that is, it's a non-contact lens. So, in industry and among uh, the lay population and even some uh, or many optoms who dispense these lenses, they'll call a scleral lens anything that's bigger or not a corneal lens, bigger than 10, 10 millimeters. But that's not very rigorous. There really should be both diameter and fit definitions. There are cornea scleral or what are called interpalpebral lenses. These sometimes touch the cornea, that's okay. There is gross movement that you can see at the slit lamp easily, and there's no seal, and these are fine for the cornea. The question is, can you get one that the patient tolerates? There are mini scleral lenses, and this is the bulk of what's being sold as sclerals these days. They have little movement, they generally seal, create suction, they settle. There are many, many brands. This list is not complete. And then finally, there are what are called sometimes true or full sclerals, and these are what I'm most interested. They can seal, which is not good, or they're fluid ventilated, allowing for tear exchange. Bigger is better, and I recommend going larger to avoid seal. There are also many brands. 
generally in the US there is increased awareness, acceptance, and availability of scleral lenses. This is true internationally, and there's been a big growth in availability uh, in publications in the last decade. I recommend these two resources that describe the uh, academic field and then this online resource that's a guide to scleral lens fitting. My clinical pearls as far as scleral lenses is that mini sclerals and cornea sclerals can be pitched as scleral lenses. The fit may not be equivalent to physiologic function if fit is defined as good initial comfort and vision. These mini sclerals may not be appropriate for ocular surface disease or grafts because they may develop suction, haze, there may be a narrow bearing zone at the limbus, and the seal may lead to hypoxic complications. True sclerals or pros treatment are less likely to have these issues. Fluid ventilation is critical to function. Bigger is better. Now what's pros treatment? It's an innovative integrated medical treatment model for complex corneal disease developed by Boston Sight. It's not about the piece of plastic. It's about the process by which physiologic or prosthetic function is achieved. Innovations beyond pros treatment relate to the design and manufacture of scleral lenses. There can be molding that then gets translated to 3D printing, that's the iPrint Pro. There are now advances in image guided design and fit related to OCT or surface profilers that sometimes use fluorescein. Also, wavefront uh, data can be used to optimize the optics or to customize the optics. Just like in uh, refractive ablations, things can be wavefront guided or wavefront optimized to reduce the HOAs. The outcome as far as treating keratoconus with scleral lenses, we now know from publications on pros treatment that there is no cone that cannot be fit, that scleral lenses are an option after high drops, and there are publications from around the world on this topic, that scleral lenses and pros can reduce the need for keratoplasty in keratoconus, and there is five-year data showing that there can be continued wear and improved visual function over a very extended time period. The new paradigm for contact lens and keratoconus is that a patient is not a contact lens failure without a trial of a full scleral lens at 17.5 millimeters or larger. Pro's treatment is an innovative approach that can accommodate any cone. Penetrating or lamellar keratoplasty should be undertaken only for axial opacity that limits vision, which is measured in a scleral lens. If you haven't offered a scleral to your patient with uh, a scar you need to before you make a decision. There should be no regraft for cylinder or recurrence of ectasia without a trial of a scleral lens first. So, in summary, expanding options in rigid lenses. The take-home message is that bigger is better, and I'd like to thank my family and Boston Sight for images. Thank you very much. <laughs>